Hello and welcome to a new episode of Nos Confundens Terra Infinita Map by Italian PNC, that being myself. So, first of all, what are we looking at? What are we doing here? This is the eighth episode of a series I'm working on on the Nos Confunden map of Terra Infinita. This is a map made by another content creator, but also by a book writer called Nos Confunden, who has his own YouTube channel if you want to check it out, but it's in Spanish, so you know, you're taking that risk. Uh, but you know, this map is amazing. It basically shows a world where, well, not a world, the literal universe, or at least most galaxies, in a sense where everything is basically without space. So space is not physical, like we don't intend it like in the sense of space being with the stars and stuff like that, but everything is on a single plane, a huge plane, which can be traversed upon. So as you can see, things like Earth are depicted as we can see here. So we can see the known lands of Earth, which are the inside part of Earth. Then we can see the second, uh, I mean the first ring uh, around Earth and the second ring about around Earth. This entire map has a bunch of places since it's literally the universe, one of the biggest maps ever worked with. 15,000 pixels per 15,000 pixels, so insanely huge, all right? And this map is amazing. It connects both dots with uh, astronomy, astrology, everything related to the, you know, those kind of subjects with mythology, uh, the ancient knowledges of the ancient histories and things like that. So it's extremely interesting and I do recommend you check out the last episodes we worked on. So this is episode 8, so the last one was episode 7, but you don't need them to know what we're doing. So let's get right into it. So starting from the last episode, what we did was discover another part of the known universe Universe, which was the lands of Nibiru and the planet X plus Aquileia, uh, Ara, Scutum and I don't remember what this one was, Corvus, yeah. So as you can see this red outline I drew myself means that everything inside of the red outline is places we already discovered in previous episodes. So we started of course with our earth which as you can see has the basically the inner parts which are the known lands and we went all the way to like places like Ptasia, Asgard, Germania, blah 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 like this. And then finally we get we got to the second circle and we started exploring other planes of existence like the lands of Mars, the Anunnaki lands and similar concepts. So one thing you have to understand is that all of these are linked with each other so there is no like incongruence. It all makes sense in the big picture so you have to understand things like mythology don't make sense when uh, looked in a single like uh, purpose but when looked in the context of the Nos Confundent map, they do make a lot of sense. So things like the places where the ancient divine beings of Egypt are, where the ancient uh, afterlife of the Greeks is, like here we have Elysium, and uh, other subjects like that, the lands of Neptune, like that being not the planet Neptune, but the literal incarnation of the sea, Neptune, Poseidon, you know, that guy. And also his sons Tr Triton and his wife, I think, Nereida. Things like this, alright? So you have to understand all in this context. You have a lot of planes of existence that have life on them, so you have like actual like kind of aliens living there or you have divine beings and their uh, like mythological creatures living there as well. So you have places more... Um, ethereal like we saw with the places right here Baldur, lands of tear heimdall all the nordic inspired places and then places that are much more like clearly existence and physical like the second earth lands of clones which of course we already talked about in a previous episode so now that we did a little recap let's see where we are at in the discovering of the universe of the map of nos confundum so as you can see when uh, zooming out of the map we discovered about two thirds of the map, with the most recent topic being the ones I just described right here. But we have actually been doing something like this, like a, a circular motion of exploration. Yet, when coming to this part of the map, this one third right here, I have been having a lot of uh, trouble basically understanding some of these subjects because there is very few informations on them. So, to fix this, I decided to go back to the origins and back to something we did not touch in a lot of time. So, that is this part of the map right here. Which which we did kind of skip in the past, but with a lot of research and a lot of more information being found out every moment we look into it, I managed to compile uh, like a number of places we can talk about without any problems. So as you can see, we did talk about places like the lands of Hydra, Dube, lands of Eris, the Celestial lands, Terra Incognita. This one is one of the subjects that Nos Confundim himself actually made a video on there recently on his channel. Of course, once again in Spanish. So if you don't understand that, then just stick with me, or you have you can use their um, subtitles if you want. 
Uh, plus, you know, we started looking into the Hinduist religions like Brahma, which will be present into this episode, because you'll see why. And also, uh, other interesting facts about Greek mythology like Pollux, Castor, and Heda, all these planes of existence being the ones of the resting places of these characters from Greek mythology, basically. Or also very physical places like the Toxic Lands, which were literally a wasteland of a uh, previous advanced civilization that exists on this plane of existence. So now that that is all uh, sure and all done and all recapped, we can get to the new subjects. So first of all, let's get into Lacerta's land. This is of course outside of the places we discovered in the previous episodes and is part of this basically for this little part of the known universe that we have not discovered yet, we have not discussed about yet. Of course, this is quite, uh, you know, filled with planes of existence, there's a lot of information here to go on, but we won't be doing all of it, of course, in this episode, otherwise we would be here for like 2-3 or three hours, which will be for something only uh, left for the mega episode, which will be done when the entirety of the Noscom Fundum series on this map is finished, which will be in a long time, it will be like a 10 hour episode, like a recap, not a recap, just literally the compilation of all the things we have known so far through this map. A huge mega analysis of this map, but you will see it when it comes out. Uh, of course, when we finish the entirety of the rest of the map we're talking about. That said, let's get into Lacerta's lands. So first of all, of course, let's see uh, Lacerta's lands. You can see that it is basically in the midst of the lands of Hydra, which we talked about earlier, and the Celestial lands. So the Celestial lands, Terra Incognita, we know are completely separate from any other planes of existence in the universe. Because of its location and its frigid wastelands that basically block, which are these ones right here, which basically block any form of travel into these lands and make it one of the most unknown places in the entire universe. So of course no real contact with these, except for these little passages, because of course they are made out of frigid wasteland, so not really something you can pass through. The other part are these oceans I believe of helium, which are right here, and of course are not traversable because of this thick mantle of a believe some kind of uh, mineral that uh, blocks the um, Lacertus lands from anything else. Although you could go from the lands of Hydra to the Lacertus lands by passing through this if you were able to go into this ocean of helium and then pass underground in this place right here. So a passage among like this, you know, doing something like this. But that said, let's see what the lands of Lacerta are actually. So first of all, the Lacerta's lands are a plane of existence in the northern celestial sphere, which is, of course, this part of the universe right here. They are part of a constellation, which were first discovered by the Polish astronomer Johannes Erhelius in the 17th century. So, something very recent compared to most astronomy that has very, very long existing uh, like knowledges even in the ancient times. But you will see how inside of it there will be something way more ancient. So, what's interesting about it is its, uh, its name, so Lacertus, means literally lizard in Latin. So, Lacerta in Latin means lizard. So this is kind of the motif we're going for in this entire episode, you will see why in just a minute. Uh, what's inside of it? Well, very clearly we have multiple ice walls, multiple barriers that uh, block the main continents here and the other uh, rings from the rest of the ice walls. We have two, what appear to be two stars, two uh, basically balls of light that um, lighten the entire plane of existence and of course multiple continents which seem to be one major one with a single island near to it which has a mountain chain in it um basically a, a lake inside of it and then four minor continents of course the sizes of these continents have to be uh, you know just compared to earth so as you can see they are pretty pretty damn huge the entire main continent is almost as big as the entirety of the land masses of earth's known lands so everything from asia to africa to Europe, to Australia, and so on and so forth. So this is basically the geography. As you can see, there are very easily passable um, passages from the Tierras de Sesha to the outside rings, as there are no like locked-in rings, as you can see right here, except for this outer ring. But once again, you can see there is a passage right here. So if you were to want to escape from the Tierras de Sesha, you would have to do something like this, then go here, then go here, and then go right here. And there you go. There is basically this amount of land that you have to surpass. But let's talk about what the Tierras de Shesha, which are to be translated in Spanish by the um, lands of Shesha, actually are. So, for research on it, the one thing that connects everything is, of course, Shesha. So, what, or better, who, is Shesha? 
Shesha is a serpentine, reptile-like, primordial being of creation in Hinduism, so the Hindu religion. It's referred to as Sheshanaga, Snake Shesha, and King of All Serpents. When Shesha uncoils and unrolls, time itself is affected as it is moving forward, bringing about an age of creation. Yet, when Shesha rolls back into its coils, the entirety of creation that was created into its first movements ceases to exist. So as you can see, this is a very primordial, very powerful being from Hinduist um, religion. Shesha's appearance is one of a multi-headed great snake, whose heads can go from seven to a million, each crowned by an ornate crown that represents a part of its created domains. There are clear similarities with other figures in mythology in other parts of the known world, these being with the Hydra from Greek and Roman mythology, which was a serpent in Greek in ancient Greek mythology, which had usually seven heads and could regrow their heads when they were sliced off, and then with another serpentine figure in Norse mythology in this case, which is the Jormungandr, Jormungandr basically. The serpent that was so big, he was able to basically um, surround the entirety of the world's oceans by going one from like his head to his tail and he lived in the oceans of the Norse uh, like Scandinavian oceans and was hunted by the gods so already we can see correlations with these other two um, Indo-European religions just like the latter, so Jormungandr, Shesha has a fundamental place in the story and setting of its pantheon, as its uncoiled body serves as a bed for Vishnu, the form of the Trimurti, supreme divine being in Hinduism, that commands and exports death. So you know how Oppenheimer, the guy that basically made the uh, first nuclear bomb, said that I am become Vishnu, the destroyer of worlds. Well, that is what we are talking about. We are talking about the basically entity that destroys and ends creation in Hinduist mythology, and this figure is literally usually asleep on the body of Shesha. So this serpentine huge being with almost a million heads has to be the basically the bed of Vishnu in most of its time on Earth. So, Shesha himself was said to have taken incarnations on Earth, even up to six of them, while his snake-like form was seen floating on top of the Himalaya mountain chain in the ancient times. So just for uh, just to understand this clearly. So basically, although the plane of existence of the Tierras de Shesha and the Sirtis lands is right here, he was seen in ancient times basically on top of the Himalaya mountain chain, which of course is not really seen in this very very small map of Europe, but you can see it because like right here, uh, wait, yeah, actually it's, it's actually very funnily covered by this the, the name Asia right here, but the Himalaya mountain chain would be somewhere around right here. So the tallest mountain chain in the world, if I am not incorrect, where the Everest and the K2 mountains are, so you know, very famous place. And the Shesha was basically on top of it, either on top of a mountain or even uh, just floating on top of the mountain chain. When reading the actual books that describe the ancient Hinduist uh, mythological figure of Shesha, he is described as 2000 eyes that have the reddish splendor of the rising sun and with this body in white and covered by a glossy texture that makes him appear like the mountains. So just to understand the size of Shesha, much like Jormungandr in Norse mythology, we're talking about a huge being that can be the size of literal mountains and, you know, because of the fact that it literally brings death on its deathbed even, which is actually pretty funny when you think about it, it is an extremely powerful being. This we can see in the geography of Lacerta. So the geography of the plane of existence of Lacerta's land can represent very clearly the role that Shesha, the creature, uh, played in Hinduist mythology. As you can see in the Tierras de Shesha, we do have multiple landmasses which could be representative of the many crowns worn by each head of Shesha, while the central mountain chain right here might be the original mountains he inhabited before making his appearances on Earth in the ancient times. So probably what happened is that Shesha, being the you know, like 
figure he was in mythology was usually in Lacerda's lands, but when, you know, the entirety of the Hinduist religion came apart and came along, then he went to Earth and made his appearances as Vishnu's um, Deathbringer. I mean, more like I said, more like his bed, but you know what I mean. And then he came back to Lacerda's lands. Or maybe Lacerda's lands are now uninhabited and have no presence of Shesha, neither his servants or anything else. Maybe they are a lost world of a uh, lost plane of existence inside of the universe and have nothing there to see. Yet I don't think this is the case because of the geography seems to be still very lush, still very full of vegetation and even the lake the fact that it has many ice walls and of course the two stars and even if Shesha is not there anymore because it's gone on earth permanently then I still think some sort of civilization exists in Lacerda's lands. Also a small pseudo historical fact on the ancient people and gods and aliens and all these kind of things that has to do with reptiles and serpents. I was researching in the Terrace of Shesha, Lacerta's lands and all these things and we will see very clearly and as the next topic what I'm talking about and one of the things I noticed were some kind of reptile-like figurines which were discovered in Mesopotamia something like 50 or 60 years ago which were the figurines of Ubaid. This was a place in Mesopotamia which is nowadays Iraq and Syria and some other like countries near them so maybe Kuwait and uh, Jordan you know that kind of place you know and there you found these figurines these Ubaid figurines and they were of some reptile like forms of higher intelligence. They looked like a human with a reptile face or a reptile with a human appearance. So very very like weird and they, we don't really know what they were supposed to refer to. They could be just like kind of the ancient Egyptians which made figurines of their gods uh, similarly to the like body of a human and then head of a beast. But it could be different, it could be representing something more like Shesha or something we are about to see in the Isla de los Reptiles, so which is our next location to talk about. So right here, Isla de los Reptiles. Uh, for anyone even slightly proficient in Spanish will know that the land uh, we are on looking at right now really translates directly to the island of reptiles, literally Isla de los Reptiles. And this place is weird, alright? So seeing the theme that has been creating under our eyes, that of the lands of Hydra, which were the ones we discovered in a couple of here, um, episodes ago and of course are right here, then the uh, lands of Shesha, which we just saw, the lands of Lacerta, so the lizard lands, and you know, this kind of thing. Uh, the element that links all of them together is some kind of reptile, some kind of influence of reptile, reptilian-like beings. Uh, like intelligent life forms that have been in contact with humanity in various points of history. And although the concept of intelligent reptilian life has been much debated, its possibility is not to be dismissed. So it's not completely unsure of it. Uh, for example, the dinosauroid, a hypothetical species created by Dale A. Russell on the basis that dinosaurs, especially the Troodon, a dinosaur already famous for its high intellect, would be able to evolve human-like intelligence if left to the right conditions. So this is something to consider. We don't know if, you know, reptilian-like life forms exist, and we, of course there's a lot of debate and stuff like this. Now, I don't personally believe in the existence of any alien life form with an Earth-like reptilian characteristic. I think it would be too uncanny and the only possibility of it would be if some ancestral reptilian life forms formed a super advanced civilization on Earth and then decided to spread and explore the galaxy all without relieving any archaeological trace. Uh, I just don't think that can be possible, but who am I to say? Feel free to discuss the topic and points that go towards it in the comment section. After all, I'm just something, I'm just someone that has to narrate this stuff, and I'm not the one that has to make up the theories, you know. But basically, the Isla de los Reptiles is also very, very interesting and fascinating because of its geography. Because you look at this and you go, okay, so this is Isla de los Reptiles. Is there anything weird you can see? I can. What's up with it? Why does it not have a firmament? Why does it not have ice walls? Why is it not circular? So Isla de los Reptiles looks to me some kind of asteroid, some kind of body 
that is not round, not meant to be a plane of existence, a normal firmament, you know, you know the whole gist of it. Almost every plane of existence has a shape that is something like this, rotund, you know what I mean. There are exceptions, like the Tierras de la Desilusión, but we thought that the Tierras de la Desilusión might not be a real thing. Well, the Isla de los Reptiles might be real, and if that is the case, then how do you explain its appearance and its weird geography? Its geography becomes even weirder when you see that it is somehow lush, full with greenery, even seems to have a even like forest-like appearance in the middle here, and then another kind of uh, plain-like appearance in the middle of the upper middle. And that cannot really be explained because without an ocean, without water, how can you sustain that kind of life? And also, what's up with all these islands it has near it? Wouldn't those just go far away in the like? nothingness of this plane of this part of the universe especially considering this as the northern celestial area well i don't really know this is very interesting i noticed this and i couldn't explain it to myself properly so you know you are free to tell me if you know anything about it the isla de los reptiles and why it does not follow the kind of construction and uh, you know this kind of theme that every other plane of existence in this map follows well it is completely different and its shape is very weird so that's it for the Isla de los Reptiles. Next thing we can look at is the Nucleo... Actually, actually, let's not go to the Nucleo 294 yet. We have to talk about another topic right now, which is Boreas. Before we get into this part of the universe, and this galaxy I assume would be since the color of the, um, like the walls that surround it is different from the other ones, then I want to talk about Boreas, which is part of the Babcock galaxy, which is part of the Pollux galaxy, which we already saw previously, so there's something that we already did, nothing too new, you know, you can, we can work with that, you know, we can work with that. So we have to talk about Boreas first. Boreas, or Boreas, is another plane of existence. This one is more familiar in the shape. As you can see, it is much more similar to the other ones we have already talked about. Boreas seems to have no sort and any kind of ice walls. It has one single wall that uh, forces it, of course, outside of anything. Like, it, it is blocked, as you can see, but it is obviously easy to passage through this street if it wasn't for the fact that these seems to be the same kind of dark matter that we saw in the lands of the Custodians, the lands of Tyr and Boulder, and all these places right there, which apparently is not able to be traversed. This kind of, kind of matter doesn't seem to be able to be traversed, except for a divine being or a dead person. So a soul, basically, something ethereal, something you can go with astral projection, but I don't think you can do it with physical uh, matter. So Boreas is one another of those places that has nothing to do with like living beings in the physical form, just as we saw with the Pollux, Castor, and Alheda, as all of these places were basically unable to be used for non-souls versus or all even just not just the uh, divine beings. And the same thing goes for Boreas. So Boreas, what does that mean? What is it all about? Well, that's pretty simple. Boreas is a character in Greek mythology, the personification of the North Wind. So, North Wind, what does that remind us of? Well, that's easy. Boreas, even the name suggests it, it reminds us of Hyper Borea. What that is? Well, it is even the map itself, so we don't even have to go anywhere to search it, but where is Hyperborea? Hyperborea is literally the land beyond the North Wind, which we saw on Earth, which is right on top of the, Art of the like, Arctic. Yeah, that's, that's right, because the Antarctic is the other part. That said, we have to remember that Hyperbore itself is a theory, there are many suggested locations, we saw that in one of my older videos, but let's not dwell too much on it. What we have to remember is that it is a theory that was started by the ancient Greeks, which uh, said that there was one land uh, basically north of the north wind, like even further, the, the northernmost land ever. That is the concept of Hyperborea, the northernmost land ever, and in this case, Hyperborea is right here, and then we have Borea here, which seems to be the land of Boreas, the figure in uh, Greek mythology. So the little god of the north wind and the personification of wind. So this figure is described as a winged bearded man who lived in the clouds and controlled the winds that allowed the boats to set sail. So a very, very competent and most of all important figure in uh, Greek mythology, Boris, the, is even the name that is given to the winds in parts of the world. Like in Italy, the Bora, which is called like that, uh, is meant to mean the wind that goes from the north, uh, I believe, the northeast of the country, which is usually very cold and kind of just 
very very strong it's one of those wins that just go and bring everything with them very strong wind very cold wind and the plane of existence of boreas kind of reflects this as you can see it has one light so one source of light which is one star of course but the plane of existence itself seems to have no real uh, solid matter that can create civilization it seems to have just frigid wastelands like this one right here and some islands also covered in ice this is a motif we'll be seeing a lot lately, especially in the next topics we're going to talk about. But that said, Boris is kind of finished. There's not much to talk about this. It is a minor plane of existence, yet I still needed to do some research on it because, of course, it's not like that simple. Yet we still can link it with the rest of the uh, the Greek mythology stuff we have talked about. And it does check out because of Alheda, Castor and Pollux, which we talked about, which were, of course, very linked with Greek mythology, seem to be in the same galaxy, in the same galaxy called complex of um, Boreas, so that makes sense and seems to check out pretty nicely. Next we can talk about the Nucleo 294 or 294, which is a nucleus. So what are nucleuses? We already seen a lot of times what nucleuses are, but for new arrivals we will talk about it very shortly. So nucleuses are not planes of existence in the traditional sense. Nucleuses are literal uh, I would say it cores, I guess the, the translation would be something like a core, a core of energy whose existence and purpose is literally to serve as an energy source for the entirety of the galaxy that is linked with them. So we saw this a lot of times with other uh, nucleuses. We saw it with the nucleus uh, 284, one of the first I believe we ever saw right here next to Tanya Australis and al -Qaid. Then we saw it of course in our places um, like this near Titanides and Leonis right here in the um, like uh, south east of the map in uh, Nucleus 286 and of course there were more examples of this there were even nucleuses all over the rest of the universe but of course the places on the edges seem to be the ones that have the most necessity for nucleuses and I think the reason for that is simple just like we saw with Nucleus 280 the places on the edge of the universe seem to have less power than the places in the center of the universe apparently the center the more central you are to this area here so next to the anunnaki next to the lands of the custodians and this entire area here also next to earth might be a bit uh, earth centric or what was it like geocentric but that's fine all right it's just it's just a map after all and that seems to be the case where like the outer places of the universe of the known universe seem to be less uh, basically energy based, energy sufficient than the ones in the center of the universe. Which would explain pretty simply why Nucleus 294, much like Nucleus 280, Nucleus 282, Nucleus 284 and on and on and on, seem to be all in this part of the universe and have to, you know, just provide the energy as cores of the entire uh, galactical complex. As you can see here, I believe there is another nucleus right here, but it is not directly linked with the places near it. So Pollux, Skedar, um, Skedar, Shedar, I'm not sure, Lands of Silence, blah blah blah. So these places seem to not be directly linked to the nucleus 276, though it is, seems to be that this nucleus does reserve some kind of energy for this part of the galaxy or the universe. And I think the same thing can be said for the Nucleus 294, especially since it is directly linked with the rest of its galaxy and part of the universe, which would explain why it is very, very important for this part of the universe. That said, the um, like the role of Nucleo 294 is no different than the other nucleuses. We did see that the nucleuses itself, themselves can have different shapes, different uh, looks. Like this one was green, uh, made, like some kind of archipelago on it, but the fact that there are no stars usually on nucleuses make it unbearable to live in. As you can see, no stars means no light, which means kind of no life, of course. In the case of Nucleo 294, you can see they have one star, but I do believe that they do not have any kind of life forms on it because of the shape of the terrain and the texture of it, which uh, resembles ice and basically a frigid wasteland, just like the next place we will be talking about, which is Skade. And that said, let's go right into this next place to talk about in Skade. Or Skade, actually, I'm not really sure how to pronounce this. I'm just going to be pronouncing it how I think it is. So Skade, but if I am wrong, 
do tell me in the comments. I do want to be corrected if I am being incorrect in the pronunciation. So Skare is a frigid plane of existence, part of a different constellation than the other nearby firmaments in the lands of Lacerta or the lands of Hydra, which we saw earlier. As you can see, this is a completely different place. It has no frigid wastes that make it impossible to traverse or no whatever this material is that makes it difficult to reverse and it is linked to the rest of planes of existence so it is not like the Isla de los Reptiles. It is more like the other places we have seen yet there is something weird about it. So its narrative can be confused with Skadi which is a moon of Saturn but Saturn kind of cannot be what this is because when researching Skadi the first thing you can see or at least one of the first things you can see is Skadi the moon of Saturn. So one you know uh basically a satellite of Saturn. The problem with that and locating it on this map is that, um, yeah, Saturn is right here. So this can't be the moon of Saturn, right? That would make no sense. Too far away would make absolutely no sense. Usually satellites on the map are represented very near to their own plane of existence. So that already makes us a bit confused. But there is no big issue because of Skare having a very, very detailed uh, mythological um, reason to exist in the narrative of Norse mythology, which we will see literally right now. So Skare is literally on the other side of the universe compared to the lands of Saturn, which were much closer to Earth and whose mythological explanation, much like other places in the, uh, much like a lot of other places in the Nosconfinite map, was related to the um, ancient Greek gods and the ancient Greek pantheon. So a lot of places like Saturn, which we saw with the Titans, the Titans which were not part of the land of, what are the Titanides, which was another place related to Greek mythology. A lot of the universe in Nosconfinite's map has relations to Greek mythology, so you can see a lot of it, but a lot of it also has relations to other parts of mythology, as we saw with the places like, uh, what was it? Uh, one of these were was related to I believe uh, ancient Native American mythology, a lot of places are related to ancient Mesopotamian mythology like Anunnaki, Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and that goes on. And of course, Norse mythology, one of the big contenders of mythological histories and of knowledges in the ancient sagas of the Norse people. So that said, Scott is a completely different story, has nothing to do with Greek mythology, it has to do with Norse mythology. First of all, let's. The first clue that brings us to the explanation of Skare is the geographical explanation of Skare. So let's see what the plane of existence looks like. It is weird, that's for sure. Normally, the main plane of existence, like the first like area you can live in, does not have the smallest islands or smallest places to live in. As you can see here, this entire plane of existence right here. The, I mean, this entire part of the. Um, I don't even know how to call this, I guess, center, I guess, the center of the plane of existence, which is uh, walled off by this very small ice wall, has a bunch of islands, so kind of like an archipelago, resembles Earth if, like, every continent was similarly of the same size and, and they were very small, and then you go outside of this first ice wall and you can see two major, like, land masses. Of course, also covered in ice, not really hospitable, but they do exist. And then there's like this decrepit, destroyed little ice walls, probably like immersed in water or something. I guess it's it's melting or something, I don't know. And yeah, it's not really useful anymore because of course there are major, major, major ways of exit from there. But you can see this last part, which doesn't even have anything. And also, of course, there's one star for this Skare plane of existence. This all brings us with no possible coincidence to a figure known as Skare. Yes, a figure, not the plane of existence. Indeed, this character is a Jotun, also called a divine being of great heights, or just giant for short. Skare is in fact a goddess giantess of bow hunters, winter and mountains in the old Norse pantheon of the gods. It is theorized that her name Skare has the same etymology as the word Scandinavia, or Scandinavia, homeland of the Norse and the sagas. Skade's presence in Norse mythology is attested in the poetic Edda, 
Both the Jotuns and the Edda were arguments described and discussed in detail in the last episode of the Second Ring Beyond the Ice World series, where, amongst other topics, I also talked about the lands of Jotunheimer, lands of the War of the Norse Giants, which was located in the Second Ring according to Oha, mapmaker of that map of the other series I'm talking about, which of course suggested you watch it, but of course not necessary for what we're talking about, but the concept of Jotunheimer it being the homeland of the giants in Norse mythology is something we saw there and was pretty interesting when in the context of what we're looking at right now. So it kind of explains what we're talking about. In the map of Norse Confluent, I do not believe the Jotunheimer area is anywhere, so unfortunately it is not represented, but Asgard is, and you could make the exception that part of this has to do with Jotunheimer, of course, because they are linked with Norse mythology. That said, the Skare and the Jotunheimer all have a very clear relation because of course Skare being the Norse uh, goddess of winter mountains and literally a giantess herself, you know, very much makes sense. In Norse mythology, Skare was originally the wife of Njordr, a divine entity of the sea. Though it was not a love marriage and more of a messed up arrangement of the other gods kind of forced her into, which is why she eventually left Njordr and his oceanic palace to go marry Odin, the Allfather, the main god of Norse pantheon. Of the Norse pantheon, basically, so Odin, everybody knows Odin, guy without, a, guy without an eye, uh, two crows on his shoulders, I think there were crows, not ravens, not really remembered actually, but main god of Norse mythology. And Skara actually married him, so you can see why this is very important in Norse mythology. Interestingly enough, our little encounter with the reptiles, snakes, reptilian deities, and other skilly beings, so all these places like the lands of Hydra, Lacertus lands, Isla Terros Reptilus, and so on and so forth, have not ended with Skare. I thought they were over, but no. Skare was actually the one responsible for punishing Loki, god of uh, shape-shifting and mischief, after he killed Baldur, which, this is like a huge parenthesis, it's another hugely important myth in, Norse, in the Norse sagas that we also discussed about in a way older video of the Nos Confundin map, and the Skadis role in Loki's punishment was under the form of placing a snake whose teeth dripped venom continuously on top of Loki, while he is bound on the floor of a cave, suffering eternally. So that is crazy and definitely not a coincidence, which means that Skare is also related to this whole reptilian, uh, reptile thing, snake thing, We're <laughs> like this entire motif of this episode we are looking at right now. Also Baldur, the guy I was mentioning about earlier, there is already a long explanation of that entire myth in the, I believe, the second episode we ever did on the Nos Confundum series, and we did find the literal plane of existence of Baldur earlier, Tyr, and I don't know how Loki does not have, get a plane of existence because, of course, it is Loki. But we do have Heimdall, so the uh, land of the death, I believe so. So, yeah, we have information on those if you want to go look at them later. But that said, so Skare, yeah, once again, related to snakes. But, of course, the Norse goddesses of giantess, uh, the giantess Norse goddess of winter mountains, though it has relations with snakes through Loki, herself is not a snake or a reptile of any kind, so just don't get too, like, messed up into it. This. this famous goddess of winter might be the cause for the place of existence appearance, as she might have repurposed the world uh, created at her will to serve as a new breeding ground for herself and the other Jotun, the other giants of the Norse. Though who can know for sure, of course, we can't be sure of this, but it would make sense in a while, because otherwise how would you explain life in the plane of Gizinskare? I think it makes sense. These giants do not have the necessity of, you know, nature, uh, like plants, animals or anything. They're literally ice giants. They live in ice. They live in the northernmost parts of the world when they lived in our world, and of course in Skare, if it was repurposed, they would feel right at home, and would also explain why the continents are kind of shaped like these, and why the ice walls are not really necessary. So this entire thing is kind of interesting. I really think this is the right like link to Skare, the plane of existence, and Skare, the Norse goddesses and giantess, and all the Jotun facts, which is kind of a weird and also cool coincidence that we did have the episode on the Jotunheimer people, the Jotun giants, right below 
this one in terms of episodes on series. But yeah, that's that's just another another subject, you know. Yeah, let's not diverge too much and talk about these kind of things. Now let's go to Tsaofu, probably the last place we will look at in this episode. It is another minor plane of existence in general, not really important. His story is not really interesting, unless if you go and see Tsaofu as the real, apparently real figure of like Chinese history. You know, I like linking historical facts to this map, but I think that's too much of a stretch. I will just tell you the astro astronomical like relation of Tsao Fu. So Tsao Fu uh, is romanized, so in Latin, it is romanized as Cepheus. Cepheus is part of the constellation that in Chinese is called the Immortal King Constellation. So Tsao Fu is one of those, pl those places that have to do with Chinese astronomy, astrology and all of those things. Also, the Immortal King Constellation. Very interesting, very cool, honestly, very nice title to have. That said, the story of Tsao Fu as a character would be one related to the history of the seven, I believe the seven kingdoms or something like that, six kingdoms? Six kingdoms, probably. The period in ancient Chinese history where we have all these kingdoms fighting each other and all these kind of subjects like that. And Tsao Fu would be like a warrior commander, a, ch a charioteer, I believe, in this entire feud. And then eventually would become kind of like a founding figure of one of these kingdoms and also kind of a immortal in like divine beings but that entire thing is kind of weird and out of place i don't really think it has anything to do with it but you can tell me if you want uh, about south Fu if you have any other information on it that said i think i'm going to be closing the episode right here where we stand we have discovered more information of course like any other episode we ever did uh, i will be adding these places we discovered today to the entire red outline thing we're going with So the next episode, I'm not really sure what we will do. I am interested in looking at the lands of the Forgotten Humans and discovering much about them. They were one of the subjects I did want to include in this episode originally, but I knew I was going to be talking about a lot about Skare, Lacerda's lands and all these other subjects, so I decided not to include them in the end. That said, we have a lot more information to go in this part of the universe before we go all the way back here, or maybe I'll just jump right there if the uh, conditions are right. There are some places in this part here which I'm very interesting, uh, very interested about as well, like Andromeda, El Templo de Zeus, and the lands of Hercules. Might have anything to do with the mythological figure Hercules, also related to the mythological figure of Hydra. I don't know, which is why we'll do it in the next part, added to the knowledges we discovered about the map. There's much more to learn, there's much more to do, so of course I'm hoping you see each other in the next episode, and thanks for watching. Remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this kind of content, and also write a comment to just whatever, say whatever you want to say, honestly. But I do want to hear your opinions on the Tsao Fu thing and their Isla de Rosalepides. So yeah, thank you for watching, see you next time, goodbye.